Happy Man of Monday, everybody. My name is Renee Cannon, and I'm the pastor of the Temple of Praise Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is located in Cleveland, Ohio, and nestled within the comfortable confines of the Great Allegheny West Conference. Uh, it's good to be with you again, Berean, and I'd like to thank uh, Elder Manushka Gracia for the invitation to speak uh, for Man of Monday, in which I tune in uh, whenever I see it coming across my feed. It's something that just brightens my day and helps me to get the week started. And I want to, uh, I'm thankful rather, uh, to be given the opportunity to help you do exactly that on this good Monday. Uh, so I want to go ahead and invite you to open up your Bibles now to Luke chapter 9. Uh, and from there, I just want to read verses 10 through 17 uh, and use this as the basis this morning for uh, my devotional thought. Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17. The Bible says this. And the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging in the city called Bethsaida. And the people, when they knew it, followed him. And he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them uh, that had need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, then came the twelve and said unto him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the towns and country round about and lodge and get victuals, for we are here in a desert place. But he, Jesus, said unto them, Give you them to eat. And they said, We have no more but five loaves and two fish, except we should go and buy meat for all this people. For, there, for they were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down by company, by fifties rather, in a company, and they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and break and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did eat and were all filled. And there was taken of fragments that remained to them 12 baskets. Uh, and this morning, the title and the topic of my devotional thought uh, is entitled Chitlins and Things. Let us have a moment of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this Monday, Lord, for your word says this is the day uh, that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So, Lord, help us uh, to get off uh, into a Monday morning of praise uh, today. And Lord, let uh, something that has uh, been said, Lord, uh, be instrumental in carrying somebody through this Monday today. It's in Jesus name we pray and let us all say amen. Uh, now, I know uh, for a lot of Bible believers, um, the title Chitlins and Things uh, might be a bit unpalatable, uh, unappetizing, or outright down off-putting to you. Uh, and the reason for this is because we know that the Bible teaches us in Leviticus 11, verses 7 and 8, that the pig or the swine is unclean. And because it is unclean, we should not eat of its flesh Neither should we touch of its carcass. And it's because of our understanding concerning pork that the topic of chitlins might be a bit disconcerting for some of you. Uh, however, if I can keep it all the way real with y'all this morning, my current belief on the subject of chitlins hasn't always been my testimony. Uh, for I didn't grow up in a family that knew anything about these biblical truths or mandates. And subsequently, these weren't dietary restrictions that we ever observed. Uh, coming up in my family, it wasn't uncommon to eat pork three times a day. Uh, for you could have bacon for breakfast, a hot dog for lunch, and pork chops for dinner. Uh, in my family, we ate pork all the time. Uh, we were people that ate the pig from the rooter to the tutor, as they say, or from the beginning all the way until the very end. There was no part of the pig that we didn't eat. We ate pig feet. We ate hog maw, pork tenderloin, pork shoulder, pork sausage. Kin folk, my folk uh, even ate chitlins, which are known as chitterlings for my bougie folk, or pork intestines for those who lack understanding this morning. And thinking about chitlins, I remember one of the most traumatic experiences that I ever had with the dish. 
Uh, I was spending the night at my grandma's house on the night before Thanksgiving. And in this old wooden house, my grandma had the heat on the second resurrection. Uh, she had all four stove uh, burners on high. The greens were boiling. The macaroni was baking and the turkey was roasting. She had it so hot in the house that even the walls were sweating. Uh, the heat was almost unbearable. But to make matters worse, in the middle of all of that heat, my grandma had the nerve to start cleaning some chitlins. This was the abomination of desolation, for not only was the house on fire, but it was also filled with the putrefying fragrant fragrance of fecal funk. And I tried to barricade myself in a room to protect myself from it. Uh, I tried to put a towel underneath the door, but the towel was no match for the funk of the chitlins, for the chitlins kicked down the door and held the entire room hostage. And it was in that very moment, uh, as the sweat fell from my face and the odor oozed from my pores, that I realized that I had developed a hatred for chitlins. I even brought my hatred for chitlins up for discussion in a conversation with my grandfather. And when I told him that I did not like chitlins, he became sorely displeased with me. And he began to explain to me the long history of chitlin eating. Uh, in that conversation, he told me that the Africans enslaved in the Americas were not permitted to eat the finer cuts of meat. They simply ate whatever the masters threw away. And one of the things that they uh, would throw away was this thing called pig intestines. He said that these Africans, as a matter of survival, had to toughen up their stomachs and eat these chitlins in order to survive. Um, and, and throughout years of eating, ch eating these chitlins, um, they got so good at making them that they were able to actually transform that which was undesirable or detestable into a delicacy um, that is still devoured by some folks today. Day. Um, I hope you're still with me this morning. And, and after years of thinking on this topic of chitlins, I've now come to the conclusion that the reason that those Africans were able to turn pig intestines into a delicacy was because they were grateful. Now, I'm not saying that they were grateful for their condition. Uh, I'm not saying that they were grateful for their slave masters or any of these things. But what I am saying is that the reason that they could transform um, that rummage and debris into a delicacy is because they were grateful to have enough food to survive. And today I know that every hand you've been dealt ain't full of spades. I know that your resources ain't always what you want them to be and your, refer re your references ain't always who you need them to be. But if you want to turn your dissatisfaction into delight, your negatives into positives or your chitlins into delicacies, the very first thing you must do is be grateful for what you have even if you don't like what you've been given. Uh, I see Jesus modeling this type of gratitude in Luke chapter 9. There the Bible tells us that Jesus had just finished healing the sick and was now surrounded by a crowd that numbered over 5,000. And as the evening drew near, the time had come to send this great multitude away. But because Jesus was filled with compassion, he desired to feed them before they departed. Uh, we know from the other gospel accounts that Jesus asked Philip if he knew where they could buy some bread. But Philip responded by telling him they only had 200 denarii, which was not nearly enough to feed a crowd this size. Um, so the Bible lets us know that they began to huddle, huddle up and discuss how they would get some food when Andrew brought forth a young boy that had what the text calls five barley loaves and two fish. Now I can see the rest of the, the, the disciples looking at Andrew and the young boy with the side eye because this young fella uh, didn't have enough money to make uh, sandwiches for five people, let alone uh, feed a crowd of 5,000. And to exacerbate the issue, the text says that the young boy, he showed up with five barley loaves. Um, this is significant, especially when you consider the culture in those times. For there were two types of bread that were used throughout Palestine back then. One type of bread was wheat and the other one was barley. Now the wheat bread was similar in size to the loaves that we use today. And those that ate wheat bread were people that we call privileged today. Uh, they were those that were well off. Um, 
uh, the bougie folk um, that were used to the finer things in life, while those that ate barley bread were the poorest people in society. Uh, for this barley bread um, wasn't the size of loaves, um, but they were more comparable to small biscuits. And these barley loaves um, were so despised back then that the bougie folk um, that ate all the wheat bread would actually feed the barley bread to their horses because for them, the barley bread was barely bread at all. Uh, so this text is telling us that the disciples had not only presented Jesus with an insufficient quantity of bread, but they also presented him with an inferior quality of bread. For the bread Jesus had was strictly reserved for the poorest of society. But despite of this, um, I want you to notice what Jesus did. Um, for the Bible says that Jesus took the barley loaves, um, and when he got the barley loaves, watch this, the text doesn't say that he complained about what he had. Um, uh, the text doesn't say um, uh, uh, that Jesus went around uh, telling folk uh, that he didn't have enough. Um, the text doesn't say that he got on his social media accounts and, and hosted a pity party. Um, but verse 16 says that he looked up to heaven, that he blessed the bread, and then he broke it. Broke it. Speaking specifically on what Jesus did, the other gospel accounts let us know that when Jesus looked up, he gave thanks to the Father, which means he let the Father know that he appreciated the little bit that he had been given. And the reason Jesus appreciated the little bit that he did have, even though it was of insufficient quality and insufficient quantity, is because Jesus understood that having a little bread was better than having no bread at all. And I know some of you today have been dealing with some insufficient situations. Um, some of you have been dealing with some insufficient funds and some insufficient people. But you need to thank God for the little that he has given you. For having a little bread is better than having no bread at all. Uh, the Bible says that he gave thanks. But he didn't stop there. And we know that because the text says that he also blessed the loaves. Now this word blessed or eulogio is where we get the English word eulogize from. And the word eulogize means to offer words of high praise and adoration. And therefore, what the text is indicating to us is that after he gave thanks for the bread, he began to say good or positive things about the barley bread. Now I can almost see Jesus talking to the bread. Um, I can hear him saying to the bread, uh, the rich folk didn't want you, um, but you're just perfect for me. Um, I, I can hear him saying, uh, you're not enough for some folk, but you're more than enough for me. I can hear Jesus saying to the barley loaves, um, I thank God that he sent you in my life. Um, other folk have cast you down and counted you out, um, but I'm going to use you for the glory of the living God. The Bible says that Jesus blessed these barley loaves. And following his blessing of the bread, he then broke it and fed over 5,000 people. And when he was done feeding them, watch, watch this, he had enough left over to fill 12 baskets with the fragments. And, and, and Jesus did all of this with five measly barley loaves. Um, these were the loaves that the rich folk labeled them, um, not for human consumption. These were the loaves that nobody wanted or appreciated them. Um, but Jesus used them to perform one of the greatest miracles that's been recorded recorded in the entire lot of scripture. And child of God, I believe the reason that Jesus was able to do this is because he was first grateful for what he had. And, and folk, I believe that in these times, and instead of always complaining, instead of always talking down on certain aspects of our lives, we need to start being grateful for what we have. Um, yeah, I know your car might be missing some hubcaps, uh, and your motor might sound like a garbage disposal, but today you need Need to be grateful that you're still rolling. I know you might not like your job. Um, you might not like your bo boss and your co-workers might be getting on your last nerve. But today more than ever, you need to be grateful that you're still getting paid. I, I know times might be tough. You might have been furloughed or even laid off. Um, but you still need to be grateful that God is supplying all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Yeah, you might not like your living situation. You might be staying somewhere 
somewhere that you don't want to stay or living with some folk that you don't want to live with them. But today you ought to be grateful that you still have a roof over your head. Today I don't know what your problems are, but I but but I don't I do know that you need to learn to be content with that which you have. Um, because if you're going to turn your chitlins into delicacies or your barley biscuits into a feast, it's gonna start with your gratefulness. And today on this man of Monday, what I'm encouraging you to do is to move forward, not complaining about the things you see, but to move forward uh, in the condition of gratitude. Be grateful, y'all. Be blessed.